Welcome. Welcome to another Clean Machine Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, CEO and founder of Clean Machine Plant-Based Fitness Nutrition. Uh, thank you for joining us on Facebook Live, on Amazon Live, uh, Clean Machine Fit, and YouTube at Clean Machine Online. Thanks in advance for any likes, follows, and subscribes. There's going to be a lot of great information in this uh, video. I'm going to go over a lot of studies. I'll post up the uh, research as we go. Uh, for those following on Amazon Live, I'll post the links later, or you can check the links out um, on any of the other sites and locations too as well. So welcome and thank you for joining me. Disclaimer, this video is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. I want to give a shout out uh, a special happy birthday to our new kid, <laughs> our vegan D3. It launched exclusively on Amazon. So real proud. You can only get it on Amazon right now. It is a brand new vegan D3. It is actually the very first 100% pure D3 from organic algae. Now, why is that important? Well, because if you are getting D3 from other sources, there could be impurities in them, including a vitamin D2. Vitamin D2 has been shown in research to be only about 80%, 87% um, less effective as vitamin D3. So D3 is far more important. And even worse, if you're into physical fitness, vitamin D2 has been shown to not affect a muscle uh, strength or growth at all, whereas D3 has several published human studies showing it increasing strength. So definitely a great product. Get it on Amazon. As a matter of fact, if you're watching this video between now when it's live recorded and June 5th, you can use the code D3 launch on Amazon for 20% off. Remember that's exclusively on Amazon. It's not available anywhere else yet. So get it on Amazon and enjoy. Uh, great D3 for immune boosting, for muscle health, for strong bones and teeth. So much good stuff for D3. Everybody, I think, should be taking a good D3 supplement if you're not getting enough sunshine from it naturally. Okay, so let's jump in today's topic. It's a doozy. We're going to cover a lot of different studies here, so I'm going to move pretty quickly. I'll pull up the studies as we go so that you can see them and reference them, but I will put them in the comments section down below uh, at a later point in time too. Plus, you can also check it out uh, later. You can pause the video and recite it. I will read out the titles of the study so that you can look them up yourself if you don't have uh, the links handy. Um, so first of all, uh, we're, we're talking the comparison between animal protein and plant protein. So let's let's start with the top. All right. Okay. Where does protein come from? You know, when I talk to people and they say, "Oh, you're vegan. I'm, I've been vegan for 36 years. Natural bodybuilding champion, physique champion. So there's absolutely no reason you need to get protein from animal products. Protein is actually not even made by animals. It's impossible. They can't make it. Um, we're talking essential amino acids. Now, animals can consume protein, right? Essential amino acids and then piece them back together and make proteins, but they can't actually make the essential amino acids themselves, the building blocks. Um, so, you know, just like a foreman can take bricks and put them together and build a house, that's fine, but they don't make the bricks. And who makes the bricks? Plants make the bricks, the essential amino acids. That's actually why they're called essential, because it's essential for humans and all other animals to consume them. We have to get them from our diet. We have to get them from outside of our body because animals and humans cannot make essential amino acids. It's impossible. Uh, there are a few microbes out there that can actually eat it, but nobody's sitting down to a bowl full of microbes for breakfast in the morning. We are consuming plants. So whether you're getting essential amino acids from meat, fish, dairy, eggs, it all originated in plants. So the question then at this point becomes, why are we taking the essential amino acids, feeding them to an animal, then killing that animal and taking its plant essential amino acids? 
That's like me killing my best friend to take his money. No, I go out and make my own money and we should, as human beings, go ahead and get it right from the plants, from the source. I mean, if you think about any typical smart businessman, they don't buy products uh, you know, from retail to try to resell them. No, they buy them wholesale. They get them from the source. They manufacture their own, right? And that's what we should be doing. We should be getting our protein from the source. Okay, so that's number one. And then the second question, well, plants aren't complete proteins. Well, that's absolutely bull cocky. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not true. It's simply not true. All plant proteins are complete proteins with all nine essential amino acids. Remember, it's the plants themselves that actually make these essential amino acids. Animals don't can't make them, so they have to get them from plants. And whether that animal got them from another animal, originally they'll get them from plants. So that's the that's the pecking order of things. It goes from the plants, then to the animals. And so animals are actually at the bottom of the feeding order. We depend on plants for producing nutrition for us. So when you look at all the essential fatty acids, there are only two essential fatty acids, and that's ALA and LA. Those are the only two that are essential, meaning we have to get them outside of our body. So this thing that you need DHA and EPA, no, we actually don't need any outside source at all because our body can take ALA and, and LA uh, and omega-6 and convert them to all the other uh, forms of uh, essential fatty acids, omega-3s and omega-6s that our body needs. So it's absolutely untrue that we need animal products for essential amino acids or essential fatty acids or carbohydrates for that matter or fiber which only comes from plants or polyphenols or most of your phytonutrients all from plants so all of this nutrition is being created by plants they are what's in called biology plants are the producers of nutrition whereas animals are consumers of nutrition we eat <laughs> plants actually take dirt the soil, the sunlight, the air, nutrients from all those, put them together and form essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, carbohydrates, fats, uh, glucose, uh, fiber, uh, all your polyphenols, all these rich um, phytonutrients, all these chemicals that plants make only come from plants. So, all right, so where did we get this idea that somehow plants are incomplete? Well, it's because we were comparing the amino acid profiles of an animal product like meat, dairy, eggs, fish. And then we we're comparing it to that and, and looked and said, oh, wait, plants are lower in certain amino acids than animals. So the assumption was, well, if it's less, it must be worse or incomplete. And now we know that's just not true. Just the opposite is true. There's actually too much of those uh, certain amino acids in there. And I'm going to explain some of the science of why that's true. So let's take a look at um, two of those amino acids. They're called sulfur amino acids. One is methionine and the other is cysteine. Now they actually can interconvert to each other. So they're sometimes grouped together because they're interchangeable. In the body, we can convert methionine to cysteine and back and forth. So, but methionine and cysteine are bound to sulfur. And when you consume a lot of them, which meat and, and eggs and fish, especially fish and eggs are real high in methionine. So they produce sulfur. And when you uh, start breaking that down, our body has ways of limiting the damaging effects of that sulfur because that sulfur breaks off into a toxic form of sulfur that not only makes your poo and your, and your flatulence uh, actually really stinky. That's the sulfur smell that you smell that smells like stinky eggs. That's what gives eggs its smell actually is those sulfur amino acids those actually can be very harmful. So let's look at uh, the research on methionine versus cysteine. I'm gonna put the first one up here in the chat box. Uh, let's see, comment section. Okay, so it's up here and I will also pull it on the screen for those of you watching later or Okay, there it is up on the screen. Um, so basically what we've got here is a study, and this is the name of the study. So if you're watching on Amazon Live, 
a review of methionine dependency and the role of methionine restriction in cancer growth, control, and lifespan extension. That's the name of the study. So this is the quote from the study, and I'll read it verbatim. In humans, vegan diets, which can be low in methionine, may prove to be a useful strategy in cancer growth control. Now, why is that? Well, there is a whole group of cancers that are actually called methionine dependent cancers. And for those of you who are really interested in this, it's a great subject because just type in, go to Google, type in methionine, M-E-T-H-I-N-I-L-N-E, methionine dependent cancer. Just type that in and then write study after it. You're going to see a whole bunch of studies that show actually lowering the amount of methionine intake uh, it can actually um, be a great strategy at controlling or inhibiting the growth of cancers because these are called methionine dependent cancers. They actually depend, they feed on methionine. So the more methionine you're putting into your system, like from animal proteins, which are higher in methionine, plant proteins are generally lower in methionine, that methionine is actually feeding cancer cells. So the more you're eating animal products, the more you're feeding cancer cells. So there's a whole ton of studies out there showing using methionine restriction as a way to actually solve this problem. And you don't have to, if you just consume more plant proteins, they're lower in methionine. So this old idea that, you know, uh, plant proteins are inferior because they're lower in certain amino acids, this is actually a really good thing. That's what you want. You want them to be lower because you stop feeding the cancers with that high amount of methionine every time you're eating an animal product, especially fish and eggs. This is real high in methionine. They're feeding these cancer cells to grow. So let's move on to the next one, the microbiome. There's a great study that talks about all the different effects. And I'm not going to get too far on this because there's so much there. You should really just research this on your own. But there's a really good study that sums up all the different aspects of why it's important to, to uh, consume plant-based uh, proteins, how they affect differently in the body. And I'm going to touch on that just a little bit. But here's the study. I'm going to go ahead and pull that up on the chat box uh, so you can see it. And then I'll pull it up on the screen. And for those of you on Amazon, uh, the study is called The Effects of Vegetarian and Vegan Diets on Gut Microbiota. Uh, microbiota is what we commonly think of as our probiotics. These are the biota or the bacterial, the single-celled organisms that are living inside our gut. Now, there's good guys and bad guys. They're called gram-positive and gram-negative uh, because one has positive effects and promotes health and the other have negative effects. So what are those pathological bacteria and how do they get there and what makes them grow and multiply? So when you consume an animal protein, it is more difficult for the body to break down so the body can secrete bile. Bile will help break down these uh, animal proteins. And when they do that, they create a bile environment. Now in a bile environment in the gut, with the animal proteins there, there are bad pathological bacteria that can start eating up that, uh, that, uh, the animal proteins. Well, those bad bacteria, their waste byproduct are called putrezines. And just like it sounds, it's because it's that it was discovered that putrid smell that gives off when you smell a dead rotting animal or any rotting animal flesh. That's actually the bacteria breaking down those meats, those flesh, and giving off that putrid smell. That putrezine, though, is not just really bad in smell, but there's another one in there that those bacteria give off, which is called cadaverines. Cadaverines are exactly what they sound like. We discovered them in cadavers, human cadavers. It's what breaks down human flesh when we die. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want cadaverines in my body in high amounts breaking down human flesh. 
But that's part of the problem. These putrescines and cadaverines are carcinogenic, I mean, they can form cancer. And this high amount of putrescines and, uh, and, and cadaverines that are secreted by this bacteria, every time you put a plant-based, I mean, an animal-based protein into the gut, you've got that bile, then you've got all that bad bacteria thriving in the bile. The good bacteria can't thrive in bile. So now you've created a perfect environment to pump out these nasty side effect chemicals that are actually carcinogenic. And there's been a big correlation between the amount of uh, animal protein that you put into your gut and how it actually affects colon cancer. So on the flip side, what do the good guys eat? What do the good bacteria eat that are in your gut? They eat mostly fiber, starches, polyphenols, polysaccharides from plants. All of these are from plants and only plants. So you can't get starches or fiber from animals. It's impossible, they don't make them. This only comes from plants. So if that's what our good bacteria eat, what should we be putting in our guts? Well, not only that, do they good bacteria eat and produce a lot of other cool chemicals that are beneficial to us, they they produce something called short chain fatty acids. And one of those short chain fatty acids is called butyrate. And butyrate helps boost the immune system, helps, helps uh, uh, repair, heal and repair, and lowers inflammation. Remember these putrescines and cadaverines produced by breaking down of animal proteins, these actually are pro-inflammatory. So you're creating disease state environment. Whereas when you put plant protein in the system, it actually feeds the good guys, the good bacteria, which produce anti-inflammatory short chain fatty acids like butyrate. So you can tell by just way the, the protein itself gets broken down. Now remember, you've also got protein uh, from animal sources that can contain cholesterol, that can contain saturated fatty acids, um, that can contain, uh, Gosh, lots of different things like TMAO. So let's talk about TMAO. First, what is TMAO? So um, TMAO is trimethylene, uh, methylamine in oxide. Um, so it's a metabolite generated in the gut in response to meat consumption. And it's linked to poor cardiometabolic health. So this is another metabolite that breaks is broken down so these pathogenic bacteria that are trying to break down this animal protein that you put in your gut produces this tmao from choline or from um, uh, carnitine that is naturally occurring in the meat or the animal products and and what it turns into is a, a chemical called tmao that tmo can enter into the bloodstream actually enters as tma goes in and then is converted to TMAO in the liver. And this can damage your cardiovascular system, setting up the stage for further cardiovascular events like high blood pressure, heart attacks, uh, coronary heart disease, or uh, cardiovascular disease. So all of this is happening in the digestive system. Now, what's interesting with TMAO, you say, hey, wait a minute, choline, isn't that found in like, like soy? Well, it is. But the interesting thing is, the thing, uh, TMA can be amorulated, can be removed from the system, can be flushed out and broken down and, and left harmless by feeding these bacteria that consume fiber. So the more plant-based, they've shown that vegans especially, or people on a strict plant-based diet, don't convert hardly any TMAO at all. It's just not there. That's because we're, one, not putting in the animal proteins that create that, but two, you're uh, actually feeding the bacteria that then can break down that TMIO even if it is created so it's harmless to the body. So there's a the beautiful thing about that. So what else happens when uh, we look at that? So we're going to look next at IGF-1. So IGF-1 is insulin-like growth factor one. Now, Normally, when you consume proteins or consume any types of foods, really, uh, you increase insulin and, and, and uh, insulin-like growth factor one. These are um, the things that insulin, IGF-1, actually encourages growth hormone. And these hormones actually help stimulate the cell to 
pull in nutrients and so that the body can go in the process of healing and repairing and building new cells and all the good stuff. So that's important. What you don't want, though, is an overstimulation of that because overstimulation of that can actually cause or contribute to cancer cell growth, too. So you want to grow the good guys, the good cells, like muscle cells, brain cells, things that you need for repair, regrowth, recycling of the tissues of the bodies. What you don't want is to have so much of this IGF-1 and insulin in there that you actually start shutting down the receptor sites and even worse, stimulating cancer cells to grow and metastasize. So let's look at the study. And I'm going to put this up because it's a doozy. I'll read it out and, and stuff, and I'll put it up on the screen, too, as well. Okay, in the chat box. And I'm going to pull this up on the screen. It's a big one, but I'll read it out loud uh, for those of you not seeing it on the screen at this time. So the study is called Low Protein Intake is Associated with a Major Reduction in IGF-1 cancer, and overall mortality in the 65 and younger but not older population. I'll address that in just a second. So this study found, and I'll quote, those consuming in a high animal protein diet had a 75% increase in overall mortality, a 400% increase in cancer death risk, and a 500% increase in diabetes. And then the study goes on to say, and I'm quoting directly word for word, these associations were either abolished or attenuated if the proteins were plant derived. That's how different these different types of proteins. So all protein is not the same. Animal proteins, 75% increase in all-cause mortality, 400% in cancer, 500% increase in diabetes. Plant proteins, the same amount? Not. And the reasons are is because different things are going on. So why is that? Why did those consuming plant proteins not have this IGF-1 effect where cancer growth and, and diabetes were a big concern. Well, let's look at this next study then. I'm gonna actually put up two studies at once because they go hand in hand and they're both basically talking about the same information. And that's up in the chat box. So the first study is uh, and I will read it out loud. The title of the study is The Associations of Diet with Serum Insulin-Like Growth Factor 1, IGF-1, and its main binding proteins in 292 women, meat eaters, vegetarians, and vegans. So they were looking at meat eaters, vegetarians, and vegans and seeing how much of this binding protein in. Because it's one thing when you eat a high amount of protein, it'll raise IGF-1. Now, if too high of IGF-1 for too long, a sustained amount, you run the risk of stimulating cancer cell growth. But what if the body uses IGF-1 binding proteins that bind to that IGF-1 and then keep it neutral until your body needs it? That would be awesome because then when your body needs it for its correct purposes, the body can release it and utilize that IGF-1. When the body doesn't need it, it is bound form and it cannot stimulate cancer growth. That's the ideal place. But look what this study showed. It showed the, uh, the mean serum of IGF-1 concentrations was 13% lower in vegan women. So that's interesting all by itself. Lower, same amount of protein, lower IGF-1. So it's not stimulating as strong an IGF-1 response, which in that in itself would be great. But here's the big thing. The IGF, uh, IGF binding proteins, okay? There's two different kinds, IGF, uh, IGF BP binding proteins, number one and number two, were 20 to 40% higher in vegan women. Now that's 
what you're looking for. So by us consuming fiber and these polyphenols, all these phytonutrients that are found in plant proteins, but not in animal proteins, that once that spike of, of uh, IGF-1 is there for the body's natural purposes, the body goes in and binds it 20 to 40% more of that binding protein to keep it safe so that it doesn't stimulate cancer growth. So this is one of the reasons why we're seeing such high cancer growth with animal proteins, even at the same amounts of plant proteins, because the plant proteins are stimulating internal processes, raising IGF-1 binding proteins to make that IGF-1 safe inside our bodies and not stimulate that cancer growth. Huge difference in the way the body actually processes that protein, not only in the digestive tract, which we just talked about, but once it gets into the system and starts triggering these other hormones like IGF-1 and insulin, the body has a response to it if we are eating mostly plant-based. When you're eating mostly animal protein sources, you don't have that level of IGF-1 binding proteins, and that's when that extra IGF-1 can possibly stimulate the growth and metastasization of cancer cells as well. Exactly what you don't want. Safer, same amount of protein. So that's amazing. And of course, the, the second study is just to show you they did the same research in uh, vegan men, and they found basically the same thing too. So it's both in men and women. Now, you heard me talk just for a moment about uh, TMAO. So um, TMAO is that chemical that uh, it comes from either uh, carnitine uh, metabolism or, or choline metabolism and not found that. So there are a couple um, good studies on that. And um, since uh, I was talking about TMO, I'm going to put them up while I uh, uh, present this. So TMAO goes through its conversion process through digestion. But interestingly, fish, I'll put this up on the screen so you can read it. Uh, fish actually has pre-made TMAO. So it doesn't start out as TMA production in the gut by the bacteria, then go to the liver and get converted to TMAO, which then does the damage to the arteries. No, eating fish already has TMO pre-made in it. That's even worse. So you don't even have to go through that digestive problem. A TMAO is already done, goes right into the bloodstream and can start damaging arteries. That's terrible. Actually, TMAO smells by itself, the chemical itself smells fishy. It's actually what gives fish its fishy smell. <laughs> That's what gives it that aroma, is the TMAO. And that is the thing that scientists based, look at uh, two studies right on the screen here. Uh, the first study is uh, L-carnitine in omnivorous diets induces atherogenic gut microbial pathway in humans. Uh, atherogenic, sorry. That means, um, and then the second one is the effects of the vegetarian and vegan diets on gut microbiota. So you can see there the TMAO actually causing the damage in those studies, the links to the breakdown of that and the creation in the gut and that coming from exclusively animal-based proteins. Now it's interesting to note though too, if you are a vegan or completely plant-based or mostly plant-based and you are consuming supplemental carnitine or choline, a long term, you can get your microbiome to actually change and start producing that even if you're vegan. So I, I personally, as a vegan, a 36-year vegan, would not take uh, supplemental carnitine or choline. Uh, I can get enough from... Um, beans, greens, grains, and, and, and stuff like that too as well. Um, so plenty of good sources with it. Be mindful of it because, you know, um, those are definitely important nutrients to have, but uh, uh, you want to get them from good sources in the plant kingdom. Okay. The next one is um, health uh, is thyroid. And this was an interesting study. Um, and I'm going to put this up on the screen too, as well, um, because, you know, as people who are looking to um, improve their overall uh, appearance, their physical fitness level, uh, a thyroid is very important. 
So let's put this up on the screen uh, so that people can see it. And I'll read the study to you. The title of the study is Prevalence of Hyperthyroidism According to Type of Vegetarian Diet. So the conclusions in the diet, and I'll quote directly from the study, is exclusion of all animal products was associated with half the prevalence of hyperthyroidism. You reduce your risk for hyperthyroidism by half, 52%, uh, quoting uh, from the study. That's huge. <laughs> I mean, that, that's something that like people would say, if there was something I could take for hyperthyroidism that was 50% effective, I'd go, ah, oh, hallelujah. And there's a plant. It's consuming a plant-based diet. And they see it right there. Exclusion of all animal foods was associated with a 50% reduction in hyperthyroidism. <laughs> wow. This is amazing. And look, thyroid controls your metabolism. So if you're getting up in age and you're gaining weight, it may be because of a sluggish thyroid. Get it checked out. Go to your practitioner, get it checked out. But know that a plant-based diet can help there. That's amazing. Directly quoted from that study. So really exciting stuff. If you're trying to get fit and having a hard time with extra stubborn body weight that just won't go away, thyroid could be the, the, the condition there. And if you are reading the study, you can't help but be excited about improving your chances for not having thyroid issues by simply consuming a plant-based diet. That's amazing. Again, this is how different the animal proteins are affecting so many different facets from our gut health to TMAO to thyroid production to, to uh, putrazines and cadaverines to these bad bacteria to uh, methionine levels. I mean, much higher methionine levels and it's methionine is directly dependent for these cancers. These cancers require methionine to survive. And you're basically feeding them what they need by eating a higher methionine diet. This has been shown over and over and over in methionine restriction diets. It's really exciting information that if you just apply it. So it's not that plant proteins are too low in methionine. It's that animal proteins are too high in methionine. And that's not a good thing. So this whole assumption that, oh, because it's lower in methionine and cysteine, that must be not as good. No, it's better because of that. <laughs> and so this we've had this whole thing backwards the whole time. We keep comparing it as uh, fish is the gold standard for omega-3. No, it's not. Fish only provide preformed omega DHA and EPA. They don't provide omega-3 uh, in ALA form, in SDA form. They don't provide GLA. They don't provide the, AL, uh, the LA in omega-6 that is required for our bodies. They don't, they don't have any of the essential fatty acids in them at all. They have EPA and DHA, which are non-essential. Our body can make its own. It's a big lie that you need fish oil. You do not. Zero needs. It is not. Just simply look, type in Google, two essential fatty acids. There are only two. They're ALA and LA, and they come from plants and only plants. Fish don't make them, period. It's not there. <sighs> Oh my God, is this, I, I'm really hoping this information creates a light bulb to say, what you put in your mouth makes a difference. It's going to make an impact on your health and what you think you are getting, which is this protein, this stuff is actually made by plants to begin with. Okay, so let's look, the last one of the studies before I get into the uh, bodybuilding and why plant proteins are actually even better for building muscle than whey, the gold standard way. We'll talk about that in just a second. But the last one I want to pull up here is an all cause mortality. And what I want you to know about this one is it's not an all or nothing. The, this study actually shows the more plants you eat, the better it is for you. So even just including more salads, more vegetables, more fruits, more nuts and seeds into your diet, can improve your overall health. It's not an all or nothing equation. More plants are better. And this study really shows that and even calls it out quite simply that way.
but I'll put it up on the screen so that everybody can see it. Um, okay. Uh, this study was published in the British Medical Journal or BMJ. You can type in BMJ and you can see it there too as well. And the uh, this actually just came out um, uh, in May of 2020, and it's a meta-analysis. And uh, I wanted to give a little shout out to uh, Janie and to um, Dr. Frank Sabatino, wonderful plant-based doctor, uh, both of them super bright, super compassionate, and uh, always giving me some great information. Uh, to share with you. So thank you for that. Thank you for listening if you're listening and thank you for providing this information. So the British Medical Journal is a very prestigious uh, journal. This study is titled Diets High in Protein, Particularly Plant Protein Linked to Lower Risk of Death. So what's interesting about this study was they showed, and I'm going to quote exactly verbatim from the, the study, a dose response analysis. Now, this is important. A dose response meaning, okay, at this dose, at this level of consumption, what happened? At this level of consumption, what happened? At this level of consumption, what happened? So basically saying the more you eat of something, does it change or is it just simply an all or nothing? And that's why uh, this part is important. So a dose response analysis of data from 31 studies. So this is a meta analysis. This is looking at a whole bunch of studies, bringing all the information together. And now you've got even better than just looking at one study, which is a one off, which may have variables in it. When you do a meta analysis, you look at a whole bunch of different studies and see if there's similar data in there that gives you a single path of information that is, is pretty much cumulative. So meta analysis is generally considered a great way of looking at this when you have enough data out there to combine all the research together. So a dose response analysis of data from 31 studies showed that an additional 3% of energy from plant proteins a day, just 3%, that's a real small amount of plant proteins a day was associated with a 5% lower risk of death from all causes. So just a 3% change, having a plant protein shake instead of a whey protein shake, that's actually more than 3%. That lowered the risk of death from all causes by 5%. How easy is that to just sub out one plant-based protein burger or one plant-based protein shake in your day, per day, and you can make an impact on your health outcomes, your risk for health outcomes. I mean, that's phenomenal. Why shouldn't you do this? If it's better for your health, better for your insides, and I'll even show you better for muscle growth, then why wouldn't you, right? So it goes on to say in the study, I'll go ahead and pull it up on the screen, the conclusions, and I'm verbatimly reading from the study, Higher intake of total protein was associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality. And intake of plant protein was associated with a lower risk of all-cause and cardiovascular disease mortality. This is quote right from the study, replacement of foods high in animal protein with plant protein sources could be associated with longevity. But it's important to note, we're not talking just about longevity, which is the length of your life, the number of years you live. That's called lifespan. What I'm more concerned with is health span, how long you live a healthy life. Because if you live a healthy life up to here and then live an unhealthy life all the way out to here, that's a long lifespan but it's not a long health span. It means you're living a good two thirds of your life or a third of your life unhealthy in disease states, taking drugs, living in suffering states, living in pain and discomfort and disease states. That's not where you wanna be. Who wants a long life of suffering? That's, that's hell. What you want is a long life of health. 
So a health span is as important as lifespan. But that's what they're talking about. Now, that's all the health aspects of it. But let's talk muscle. I'm 36, I'm 58 years old, been nothing but plants for 36 years, natural bodybuilding champion, uh, natural physique champion, drug free. And, you know, I can, I can uh, just consume plant proteins, 17 and a half inch arms, 100% natural at 58 years of age. <laughs> I'm in the best shape of my life at 58. This is that health span I've been talking about. This is where you want to enjoy life for as long as you can, not just live for as long as you can. Um, so that's the big difference. So let's jump into the studies on plant protein versus animal protein and its impact on muscle. All right, let's pull up the first study. Uh, the first study, let me grab it real quick. On the chat box. And then I'll pull it up on the screen as soon as it comes up. And there it is. Okay, so this one, the study is titled High Protein Plant Based Diet versus a protein matched, exact same amounts of protein, a protein matched omnivorous diet to support, support resistance training adaptations, a comparison between habitual vegans and omnivores. Now, that, that study is a pretty big mouthful, but it's very specific, very clear. People who work out, right, support resistance training adaptations and how the uh, plant-based diet or a vegan diet uh, was matched up with the uh, protein matched exact same amounts of proteins, remember, same, same, gram for gram, same amount. It's a controlled study. And they showed that protein sources do not affect resistance training and induced, induced adaptations. That's muscle growth. <laughs> you're adapting to the training that you're doing. So your muscle either gets stronger or bigger or both. That's the uh, resistance training induced ad adaptations in untrained young men consuming adequate amounts of protein. Now that's important part, that last little bit there. Definitely, you need to consume enough protein to support the adaptations if you are exercising, especially those exercising with great intensity or looking to uh, add muscle to that. So you definitely have to support it with sufficient amounts of protein to begin with. So consuming too little protein is really not going to be helpful. Um, but when the protein amounts are the same from animals or plants, no difference in the outcomes, same amount of muscle. So that was the first study. Next study is looking at dietary patterns. Now, this was a big study. It's a third generational study called the Framingham uh, study. Uh, and it was a, a, a pretty good study. It's a little while ago, but it was good to note because it showed very in-depth, large number of people. And that's always important because the larger number of people, you can start to weed out a lot of the variants and covariance of that. Um, well, it looks like I'm having a little trouble posting it, so I'll just talk about it. Um, so this was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And it, the study title is Dietary Protein is Associated with Musculoskeletal Health Independently of dietary pattern. Dietary pattern means what you're eating. A dietary pattern like vegan, vegetarian, omnivore, those are dietary patterns. So independent of the dietary pattern, the, the amounts of muscle were the same. So this is quote right from the study, there were no associations between protein clusters. That means protein diets, whether that's animal protein, fish protein, uh, dairy protein, plant protein. So those are called protein clusters. Uh, which is the types of protein that consumers eat, uh, that the people were eating in this study. So they looked at those dietary patterns too. So there were no associations between protein clusters and any musculoskeletal outcome in adjusted models, adjusting for uh, BMI, adjusting for activity levels, smoking, that sort of thing. So you take out those confounders, and you're left with a core set of database that basically is about the same. So you're comparing apples to apples. So basically what they were saying is, 
there was no difference in the amount of muscle that was being carried in someone who is vegan or eating an omnivore diet. So that was an interesting one. Now, they did point out that the people with the lowest intake of total protein did have lower muscle. So the amount of protein is important. So you do need to eat sufficient amounts of protein in order to maintain or grow or add muscle. Um, so that was pointed out fairly in the study. Now, but they, again, there was no difference between whether that protein was from animal, simply the amount. So the amount was important, not the type of protein or the source of protein. So this next one, Journal of uh, <clears throat> Sports Nutrition, International Sports Nutrition, uh, this study was on uh, eight weeks of whey protein and rice protein uh, on body composition. So this looked at body composition specifically in people who were working out. I'll put that up on the screen so you can see it. So this study showed that, and quote, conclusion, there were no differences between the two groups. So whey protein, rice protein, no difference. So what did they do in the study? Well, what they did is used 48 grams of protein. So they raised the level of protein so that there are no differences. Now, this is very interesting to look at because you have something called a leucine threshold. So leucine is something that stimulates the cell to pull in uh, essential amino acids to build proteins. Just like insulin uh, docks to the outside of the cell and pulls in uh, 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 fatty acids, fats, and uh, uh, sugars uh, to use as, as um, energy, the leucine docks to the outside of the cell and allows the essential amino acids to come into the cell. So leucine acts as a trigger. So when you increase the amount of leucine, if you take a higher amount of plant protein, that leucine level hits the threshold. So they, they've shown in the study that once you reach a threshold of leucine, that the body doesn't stimulate muscle protein synthesis anymore. So the difference between 30 grams of protein and 40 or 50 is basically nothing. And that's because this maximum stimulation of leucine at the cellular level is taking uptaking as much as it can. Now, if that protein lasts for over a longer period of time, then there may be some longer benefits to it, but not immediate benefits. The cells can only uptake so much at a time anyway. Now, here's the most interesting study though. Um, so they said, okay, well, if that's true, let's look at the amino acid profile. Now, when you look at whey protein, whey is made for cows. Cow, a baby calf starts out about 60 to 80 pounds and needs to grow to 600 pounds. Now, I'm guessing that most of you out there don't wanna to grow to 600 pounds, but that's what that protein is designed for. It's designed to turn a baby cow <laughs> from a 60 pound calf to a 600 pound cow. That's what it's designed for. It is to stimulate maximum amount of growth all at once. Well, you don't really need that in an adult human being. Uh, you want to add a little bit of a few pounds of muscle, but it, oh, we know what happens when we try to overstimulate muscle growth. It can lead to a lot of very bad negative side effects and even cause death. Um, so that's not where we want to go. We don't want a 600 pound human being. So when you look at that, all right, so you have the, the amount of amino acids. You've got leucine and valine and isoleucine, but you've got tryptophan and, and uh, glutamine and arginine, all the essential amino acids in there, right? Nine essential amino acids. Well, if the whey protein has a lot of leucine, that means less of it is the other essential amino acids. So in a cow, that's important because it needs a lot of leucine to stimulate a lot of cellular growth. In human beings, not as much because we're not 600 pounds. So what you're giving up by having so much leucine there is you're giving up room of essential amino acids. Now that's interesting because plant proteins are lower in leucine and lower in the branch chain amino acids, but that means they have higher can have higher amounts of total other essential amino acids on a gram for gram comparison. Now that's incredible because the essential amino acids are really what the building blocks of protein are about, not just stimulating growth, but actually the building blocks themselves. 
So they said, well, if that's the case, let's take a look at pea protein because pea protein actually has higher a total amount of essential amino acids when you take out leucine, even though it had lower leucine. But let's just increase the protein to 50 grams of pea protein in one, one dose per day uh, and see what does, because then you get to that leucine threshold. And remember, anything above that leucine threshold is not going to stimulate additional muscle protein synthesis. Well, what you see there, and I'll put it right up on the screen here, and I'll read it to you if you're, if you're listening from Amazon, but this is pretty exciting. Okay, so the name of this study, and it's per, uh, published in the JISSN, and you can look it up. It's called Pea Proteins Oral Supplementation Promotes Muscle Thickness Gains During Resistance Training. A double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial versus whey protein. So double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized, this is as good as it gets. It's called the gold standard of studies. Uh, it's double-blind, so neither the doctors or the people administering it know what's in the, the drink that they're giving the people. It's double-blind, so neither do the people that are taking it know what they're getting. And it's randomized and placebo controlled, meaning somebody's getting nothing at all. So um, the the interesting thing that comes, I'm going to put this up on the screen for those watching, <clears throat> um, is here's the conclusion. Remember, I talked about pea protein having the higher total essential amino acids than uh, when you when you uh, account for the leucine, even though it's higher leucine. This is what happened. The conclusion, quote, thickness increases were significantly different between groups, 20.2 for P, 15.6 for whey. You heard that right. P protein actually increased muscle thickness 30% more than whey at the same amount. Same amount of pea protein, same amount of whey protein. Pea protein resulted in more muscle tissue. Well, there you have it. And then the reason why, again, as I just explained, it's not just about the leucine. Look, you can add branch chain amino acids to the protein uh, if it's a plant protein to boost those level up so you don't even have to take that extra 50 grams of protein. You can do a modest 20, 25, 30 grams of protein in a single serving. And along with simply adding branched chain amino acids, you can get that leucine level up to where it's maximally stimulating muscle growth and getting all the proteins. Now, uh, the, let's see if I got it here on the brand. I do. I'm going to pull up a picture here. Um, okay. So for those of you watching on Facebook Live, um, you're seeing a picture of how uh, essential fatty acids PUFAs, <laughs> polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFAs. You can see the orange, two orange dots there. So mTOR pathway is the pathway where muscle is created, is where muscle protein synthesis happens inside the cells. So mTOR requires in two different places, EPA. EPA is in a meg, oh, an omega-3. So this is very interesting because uh, we have a plant protein called lentine that is high in essential fatty acids, omega-3s. It's also, because it's all whole plant protein, lentine contains lots of phytonutrients, lots of chlorophyll, lots of polyphenols to feed your probiotics, lots of fiber to feed your probiotics. It's got lutein in it for brain health and eye health. And it's got third 30% of your total essential fatty acids for the day. So what's important is this essential fatty acids are required in the muscle protein synthesis process. You know, why have we oversimplified this equation that, uh, you know, muscle protein synthesis is all only about um, protein? It's not. There's a whole lot that goes into uh, building muscle. And it's not just about the protein but that's all you're getting in the typical whey protein is stripped out nothing but practically pure protein, like whey WPC 
80 or 90 is 80 to 90% protein. You don't have any of the fiber, zero. You don't have any of this uh, essential fatty acids, none, which is required for your body to, to, to make uh, essential fatty um, uh, proteins, right? That mTOR pathway requires EPA, which is an essential fatty acid. And this can be provided by the plants in their whole food state, not from the whey protein at all. So it's like, it's like saying, okay, I'm giving you gas to start your car, but you have no oil in the, <laughs> in the car. Go ahead, go for it. See how far that gets you. No, that's not how muscle is built. It requires lots of different things. And it's not how a car works either. You can't just put gas in it without putting oil in it or the car or the engine will freeze up. So no, you cannot do this without all the rest of the essential nutrients. And these nutrients are in the whole plants. That's why I put out a protein, clean green protein. This is the whole plant. We use the flower, the leaf, the stem, everything, all the nutrition that's in there. It's actually the very first plant in a plant protein shown to be have bioactive vitamin B12. That's how nutrient rich is. It is the most nutrient rich plant of any plant in the plant kingdom that we know of so far that we consume as a food. This is incredible. Higher in essential amino acids than pea, rice, hemp, soy even. And it's the um, has a PDCAS, which is its digestibility, close to um, whey protein. Now, we've added actually an enzyme in it to make it almost 100% bioavailable. So you're, <laughs> this, this, this enzyme is so good, it actually breaks down the proteins that actually cause gas and bloating. So we call it the first fart-free protein on the market. <laughs> But that's an important thing. What you want is the efficiency. You want more of those essential amino acids getting into the bloodstream where they can actually help you and perform and, get, and help you build that muscle tissue that you're looking for. But remember, proteins are not just for muscle tissue. Proteins are required for serotonin, are required for melatonin, are required for enzymes and neurotransmitters and, and so many different things. Our hair, our skin, our nails, they're all proteins. Even our bone tissue has proteins in it. Um, it's funny when people say, oh, uh, plants are, are, um, <laughs> are incomplete proteins. I'm like, actually, there's two incomplete proteins, and that's gelatin <laughs> and collagen. Those are incomplete proteins. They're actually missing the essential amino acid tryptophan. Now, it's funny that we've known this, that they are truly incomplete proteins, and they're both animal proteins. And they were waste products. So the meat industry said, hey, what all this bone tissue, all this cartilage tissue, what are we going to do? We're just throwing it out. What are we going to do with this stuff? Uh, can we sell it to somebody? Uh, so they came up with this idea. Hey, let's package this bone broth gelatin, right? That's good for you. And now they're selling waste material that they used to throw in the garbage and making you buy it, making you pay for it when it's a true and complete protein. And I'm like, are you crazy? What, what is that? <laughs> You're missing tryptophan. It's funny, the research even showed that long-term use of tryptophan or collagen, because it's missing tryptophan, what does tryptophan convert to? Tryptophan converts to 5-HTP and then to serotonin. That's our happy chemical. That's what makes our brain feel happy. <laughs> yes, serotonin. Serotonin is the happy chemical in our brain. And by eating and consuming collagen and, and bone broth, you're actually reducing the amount of, of serotonin. You're reducing the amount of happiness in your life. Why would you want to do that? That's just crazy. Uh, I look, I know there's a lot of companies out there selling that, but absolutely no need for those proteins. Uh, they're, they're incomplete. They're, not, they're totally missing an essential amino acid that is required for our overall health and required for us to produce serotonin. Why would you want to consume a protein that makes you unhappy? I don't get it. But that's sales and that's marketing out there and they'll sell you almost anything to make a buck. So sorry about that. But instead, I'm offering something that actually will improve your health in a whole food state lentine highest in essential amino acids, highest in nutrient density of any plant, higher than spirulina, chlorella, higher than uh, even moringa, which was the number one superfood 
This thing is so nutrient rich, it's amazing. And I like taking these incredible plants, bringing them to market and getting them to you so that you can enjoy them. Well, I know we covered a lot of data on this one, but it's a really important one because I feel like a lot of people are actually harming themselves by taking way too much protein and not getting the protein in the plant-based sources that can actually be helpful to your health. So I, my concern is, look, somebody helped me through depression where I almost took my life, drug abuse, the whole works. I came out of that as a very happy person and excited but very thankful to want to give back. So I dedicated the rest of my life to trying to help other people live a very healthy and happy life. And I hope if you're interested in the products that you can check them out and see how they uh, help improve your health overall too. That's my give back. I will contribute the rest of my life to trying to find the best in nature, these incredible plants and bring them to you so that you can use them to improve your life and live a long, health span. Thanks for watching.